You may or may not know where I was originally born. Uh, it's called Hudson Valley, New York. It is a selection of counties and towns nestled around the Hudson River upstate from New York City. One of its many attributes is very beautiful mountains with lots of trees on them overlooking the river. And there's one area that is a state park that's been in my life forever. And I've come to appreciate it in all sorts of different ways, especially as my career has traveled. It's called Bear Mountain, New York. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's been teaching me. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. My relationship to parks has changed radically over my life. Originally, you could not get me into one without tricking me, telling me we were doing something else. If my parents wanted to go on any sort of a nature walk or walking, I, I resisted it terribly. There were beautiful machines at home waiting for my every command. I would rather die than find myself outside. It's one of the reasons that I was incredibly out of shape in my 20s and 30s. I just didn't have a habit of walking as pleasure. Somewhere in there, I'm not sure why, my perspective changed on parks and going on hiking and trails. I found the enjoyment and the love in it, and I have not stopped since. Let's get one thing out of the way. It's called Bear Mountain. I understand that to people in other regions of the world, what we call mountains in New York would be called hills anywhere else, but here we are. Bear Mountain is a state park that is also next to a really unique and beautiful bridge, the Bear Mountain Bridge, that links a couple towns in the surrounding area. It's one of those bridges that goes over the river at a really high point, so everything looks breathtaking looking down. As a teenager, I could not be persuaded to ever want to go to Bear Mountain, just like I couldn't be convinced that anything involving forests and walking was going to be fun. So I did not go there a whole lot. If I did, it was either part of an event that my family wanted to go to or otherwise to visit Bear Mountain Lodge during the winter because there was a way to go sledding there down one of the hills. But it was later in my life being able to visit Bear Mountain on my own terms and with that difference of opinion about being outside that I found it really, really joyful. Bear Mountain has several complexes associated with it. One of them is the Bear Mountain Lodge, which was gifted to the state many years previously, and then it has been modified multiple times until it is now a combination restaurant and food complex, as well as tourist shop and luxury hotel. The walls still look like they were made out of logs for a log cabin, and it overlooks the main part of the mountain. In fact, if you drive in, you could go to the field near the lodge, be at the lodge to get refreshments, stop over at the lake that's right next to the lodge, and think you've seen all of Bear Mountain. But you haven't. There's another part to it, which is just not obvious and which you have to track down to get to. You go underneath the access road, and this puts you over to a pool. It is a pool that's open to the public with all sorts of vending machines and the scream of children. That is a major feature because that is all you're going to hear for some place around it. Kids having fun. If you're taking your kids out to a pool in a state park, it's because your family does not get near pools all that often, so you can tell everyone there is just going wild and having a good time. The entrance first looks over the pool, and then you go downstairs to be able to get to it, so you can watch everyone having a great time. That may be enough for you, but if you keep going past the pool, that's when you find out that there's a museum complex. The museum is really weird. 
it's a combination nature trail, zoo, and pavilion. When you're a kid, everything weird seems pretty normal because everything is weird to you. You just assume that adults made actual real decisions and what you're looking at is there for a reason. It takes you a while before you realize that that's not always the case. The Trailside Museum is self-directed. You go through a small entrance and it asks you if you want to throw some money at it, but it's completely free and there's a number of signs beautiful crafted wood signs that give you some general thoughts about what a forest consists of, how the animals within it live, and what you're looking at in, in terms of animals and, and rocks and plants and things you should be taking away. Some of the signs are so old that additional carved signs have been connected to them correcting what's on the original signs because a species was misidentified or a declaration about an area turns out to have been historically inaccurate and added for reasons that aren't clear. The Trailside Museum's paths move in all different directions. Whole families go through there, strollers and all, and there's lots of benches to sit at, and there's a few rocks there that have been carved with messages, and there's photographs of them before the words literally wore down to nothing. It's both historical and history itself. And there's also animals. It's a zoo. It's a trailside museum and zoo. The signs by the animal exhibits go out of their way to indicate that the animals are all of them in some way injured or in need of care. They were discovered orphaned or otherwise have a story about why they are in the zoo. There's a bear at Bear Mountain Zoo. It lives in a relatively large pit with a bunch of birds that hang out with it. I can't speak to whether or not the bear is in any way happy about this, but it's an incredibly well-attended attraction, and people sit up in the top area and watch the bear move around slowly in the middle of a state park. I've been there a few times, and I walk with people, and pretty quickly my mind drifts to the actual meta-nature of the Bear Mountain Trailside Museums and Zoo. Why is this here? Is it to educate? Is it to gather up a bunch of disparate area and guarantee it won't be developed because it already has a declaration as a state park? Is it meant to be a advertising campaign for people to support parks in the future? Is it someone trying to sell the idea of a park? I think it's all of these things layered on top of one another. It gets really weird when you get towards the top of the small hill that this trailside museum is on. There, there's a bunch of buildings. They were all built during the Great Works projects of the early 20th century. For people who weren't aware this went on, there were a large number of unemployed folks, and the government initiated a program to give them jobs. It's why a lot of bridges were built, a lot of buildings were built in state parks and elsewhere. It was designed simply as busy work to give people a job. And in doing so, it made a whole bunch of public areas that much nicer. It's also represented a logistical nightmare of the last century because we don't put money into public works like that, and some of these buildings have not had the maintenance they could have or been expanded upon as life has needed it. It's a series of little hacks done by the current staff trying to keep it all afloat. These buildings are fascinating to me. Besides the older architecture and the use of stone and wood in a way that quickly dates it to the 1920s and 30s, the buildings themselves have small displays inside that talk about everything from simple mineral science all the way to nature and history and figuring out your place in it. Artistically exquisite. 
They are dioramas or maps or drawn diagrams that were painted by various generations of artists, ones where they started with one artist and then 20 or 30 years later they were updated slightly. In other words, a shared experience meant to be relevant even though they'll never, ever catch up. I see people go in there. There's a building that's a reptile house and another one that talks about revolutionary era furniture that might have come from the surrounding area. And I can tell for some of them it's just getting out of the heat or letting the kids run over and tap the glass where there's a snake over and over again, ignoring the sign that tells them not to. These are low-slung buildings, often with almost no artificial light inside. They're dark and they're weird, and they're hard to maneuver in. But you feel what was trying to be done. Drilling down even farther, though, is a section of one of the Trailside Museum buildings that I've taken such a fascination to that a part of me wants to take photographs and video of it before it inevitably disappears forever. It's a couple rooms dedicated to the life of Daniel Carter Beard, one of the co-founders of the Boy Scouts. He had founded a group called the Sons of Daniel Boone in 1905, and the Sons of Daniel Boone became part of the Boy Scouts in 1910 when that was formed. There's a bit in there about his motivations for starting such a group, but more than that, it's about his life. It's about his family members, his interest in fishing, uh, open diaries and books from his life, all sorts of writings and, and paintings depicting him. It is truly, utterly surreal. I have no idea what it's for. A part of me wonders what his interaction was with Bear Mountain, if any. Did he know one of the people who owned the property that Bear Mountain became? Is there something related to the fact that the Boy Scouts do have meetings at Bear Mountain at various times? What's the link so long ago and so buried that we have essentially an altar, a sacred space to Daniel Carter Beard? After I walk around that building, uh, right next to it, there's a small path, and the path puts you at a bench that is overlooking the river right next to the Bear Mountain Bridge. It's unquestionably a beautiful sight. No matter how you feel about going through that museum, that last view is spectacular, always worth the walk. You sit down, often it's incredibly quiet, you can just find a moment to enjoy it. Again, when I was younger, none of this held any interest to me whatsoever. You could not convince me that sitting on a bench represented any sort of fun. I was about action, about commands typed into machines, about pouring over printouts and magazine articles and absorbing as much information as I could. I was starved back then for knowing more, for finding things out, for tracking down mysteries, and for being exposed to whatever new thing was coming today. Maybe it's a reflection of how much information comes to me now that I feel the luxury of wanting to take time away from a machine. But in Bear Mountain, I find inspiration about all the other work that I do. You see, Bear Mountain is more than just a museum, a nature trail, a pool, a lodge. It's also an example of presentation, of having things you want people to be aware of, both how the park operates and some of the reasons it came to be, along with information about what's inside of it and what your position is relevant to it. It has to do it with no person there, no tour guide to lead you. All of the signs have to direct you around. All of the questions, all of the concerns, they need to be answered in wood-carved signs that tell you about all the things you shouldn't do, but also all the things you should know about. These little low-slung buildings built with the luck of a public works project have to continue to be relevant. 
they are a home to these creatures, which have to be taken care of, but also justified in terms of why the Bear Mountain has a zoo, and for trying to give the visitors a real sense of what the Hudson Valley is about. Oh, sure, it fails utterly on any sort of measurement of indigenous peoples, of understanding why things came to be, about class systems, about why animals need to be caged at all to be taken care of. I have no way to defend the underside of the Bear Mountain story. But whenever I do take a visit to that park, either with a friend or alone, I do sense in it a feeling of being part of something greater than myself, and that for all the joy that it brings for people to visit the public pool and for all the clumsy lessons it's trying to teach through its signs, Bear Mountain represents people wanting other people to understand the world. That's something I appreciate very much, and I hope through all the work I've done with documentary and online sites, that people can make their own self-directed nature walks through the stacks, derive the values that they want to, and learn about a world outside themselves. Bear Mountain is open most of the year. There's a fee to park. There's no fee to go anywhere. And it is a beautiful way to spend a summer day. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Scott Roseanne, Joshua Stein, Scott McGrady, and Forrest Fuqua, as well as the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. <laughs>